Right, hi. Hello folks, I'm Bob, Dr. Bob, well actually Robert Bruce Longmore, but I'm more known as Dr. Bob Around. And uh, thank you so much for watching, so uh, let's get the show on the road. When I was asked to do this, uh, I thought, how do you condense 79 years of life into 30, 45 minutes uh, of talking? Anyway, let's see how it goes. And I hope you find it interesting. And if you have any questions as we finish, please give me a shout, okay? Basically, as you can hear from the accent, I was born in the northeast of England, uh, Tyneside, in a little town called South Shields. South Shields really uh, was a civil settlement for the Roman Wall, which is just on the other side of the river. And it's an area which was known for coal mining, for uh, shipbuilding and for fishing. So it's very much an industrial area, uh, but a very beautiful area. I always think that one of the foundations of life is choosing your parents carefully. And the parents I had, Bob and Maggie Longmore, Bob and Margaret, and there they are. Uh, superb couple. Dad and mom were very, very talented in their own right. And um, I've got the picture up, right? Uh, Dad was actually a, a goalkeeper in uh, several soccer teams and uh, did very, very well. And um, I've still got some of his medals for that. In those days, incidentally, when you got a gold medal, you got a gold medal. It wasn't sort of brass or anything like that. So I've got a couple of those. Mom was very... Uh, talented as a home cook and uh, also a painter. She liked doing her uh, watercolours. So, uh, and we had a fantastic foundation, my brother and I, from my parents, and I owe them an awful lot. Obviously, at this sort of time, you miss them because you want to talk to them, but uh, absolutely superb. I lived in this town, South Shields, for a long time, and I, I thought I'd put up the... Um, uh, symbol, the logo for uh, South Shields. You'll notice in the middle, there's a lifeboat. And they reckon that that's where the lifeboat was invented by a, a guy called William Woodhave. He invented this lifeboat to go out to some of the ships at the mouth of the Tyne, because um, there was a lot of wrecks and all that sort of thing going on, a lot of very rough seas in the North Sea. And he invented this lifeboat. South Shields itself, uh, when I left, it was about 120,000 population and people, you know, I was surprised that people had never heard of it here, <laughs> but uh, why should I be surprised? Um, people like Ridley Scott, uh, Dame Flora Robson uh, came from uh, South Shields, a fantastic area. Now, my youth was actually a youth uh, reflecting a lot of the uh, local coast, and I've put up this picture of Marsden Bay. Uh, just lately, I've been able to uh, post from a lot of uh, Facebook pages on, on South Shields. It's great. We've got the local photographers producing beautiful photographs. This is Marsden Bay. Notice the cliffs on the left-hand side, 70-foot dolomite limestone, absolutely beautiful. And I spend an awful lot, I misspent an awful lot of my youth fishing, crabbing, and beach combing and all that sort of thing in that area. It's an absolutely fantastic area. I was never restricted by my parents. They just lost me for the days and I would go out and hopefully come back with some fish or some crabs or odd lobster, mussels, all that sort of thing. Beautiful life. And so a lot of it reflected that. One of those sort of aspects I think now is that I spent a lot of time uh, I suppose you could call it wilding these days, getting in the environment, going down to the local swamps, hunting for newts, fishing, all that sort of thing. And I think it's a thing which is missing from a lot of kids' lives these days. And, but it certainly shaped my life. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, I attended South Shields Grammar Technical School for boys. <laughs> it sounds very, very formal. The girls' school I should add was about uh, three miles away. So uh, there was no temptation there. We only met about once a year for a big uh, dance. And uh, 
it was in the high school that I uh, ignited my passion for biology, for chemistry, and I, I had to do physics as well, which I didn't really like. But I um, eventually did advanced level and scholarship level chemistry, biology, and uh, we, we had marvelous teachers, teachers who never really strictly controlled us. So if there was the odd smells and explosions going, they didn't really worry. Um, chemistry was exciting. There were certain things you could only do in winter when the school pond froze over and you could get the ice to do a diazo reaction and things like that. But I used to enjoy chemistry. Chemistry is fantastic. And um, the, the problem was that I often sort of favored going fishing than studying. So when we came up to do uh, mock examinations, instead of going home and opening my books, I went fishing. I can still remember the day I went fishing. Uh, I caught some fish and, uh, you know, came back. Never felt guilty about it. It's one of those things. Anyway, uh, to cut a long story short, um, Towards the end, yes, I was a prefect at the school, all that sort of thing. And uh, the headmaster suggested I should really uh, go to university. My parents weren't too happy about it at the time. I actually did an interview for a job at ICI at Billingham and I got in. But uh, luckily they were persuaded that I should go to university. So the headmaster did a few phone calls and I was accepted into pharmacy for the next year. I didn't fill any application forms in. I went in on his uh, word. And so the next year, what was it, 1959-ish, I went to Manchester. And Manchester obviously was in the north west of England. I'm in the northeast of England, so there was a train journey down. And that was my major avenue of journey for a long time, steam trains, South Shields to uh, Manchester. Manchester University itself, absolutely fantastic place. Manchester, I always think, is a place not really understood by a lot of Australians. I suppose we saw it in the Commonwealth Games a few years ago, but uh, an absolutely fantastic place. Uh, most people know that it's got two very good soccer teams, uh, United and City. Uh, it's got the Halle Orchestra, which we used to go to quite a bit, and it's also the gateway to the Lake District and the Peak District. Absolutely fantastic place. Very big city, of course, and it had the university. The university was a very old and probably one of the best red brick universities. Uh, I looked up the history the other day. 1850, it started with the Owens College. And then about 1880, I think it was, it became the Victoria University of Manchester. So it had a massive foundation and uh, superb staff, world renowned staff in some cases, especially in chemistry. And um, it was a revelation to me uh, going, starting pharmacy there. Pharmacy was chosen by our headmaster and me as being a good sort of mix of biology, chemistry, all that sort of thing. And um, it was a revelation. The first year lectures uh, were done in some cases by world famous experts. But we gradually got into it. And at the end of the first year, I, I remember saying to mom and dad, look, I honestly don't know how I've done, but I think I've done all right. Uh, the result actually after the first year was I was invited to go and do honors. So honors became a four year degree rather than the original three years I was studying. And I was invited to do pharmaceutical chemistry and which allowed me to pursue my love at that. The staff at Manchester were very, very dedicated, very friendly, not distant at all. And we had some absolute laughs, quite frankly. Um, and it went on and um, that sort of thing, the life. I lived in a hall of residence, Needham Hall, which was down in Didsbury. Uh, again, marvelous group of lads. We all sort of clubbed together to uh, work hard. We worked hard very much in the block I was in. Uh, and we used to uh, then go out to the pub about 10 o'clock in the evening down to Disbury and have a, a pint of beer and just a chat. And um, it was uh, play hard, work hard. And actually our floor gained quite a few good degrees that year uh, in our final year. Uh, I'll be honest, I got a class one honors degree and I was very proud of that. I was very pleased with that because it represented class one in pharmacy and chemistry. 
because the chemistry was a lot of specialist uh, learning. Very, very thing. So I got uh, the opportunity to then uh, apply for a job as a lecturer. I became an assistant lecturer at Manchester and uh, joined the staff. And at that time then, I was invited to do research by a, a young, quite brilliant uh, chemist, Brian Robinson, who was over from the chemistry department. I was his first student as a, a student. And uh, he was an expert on certain organic chemistry mechanisms, uh, the fischer indole synthesis, I remember. And the, uh, he was also an expert on interesting things, Mondi money. Mondi money, I, I don't know whether you know about that, but there's a special money coinage given out by the, uh, the queen or the king. And um, he became an expert on that. He was actually invited at the ceremony and uh, he actually wrote a book, wrote two books on Mondi money. Absolutely fascinating guy. Uh, he was also an expert in coinage. He was one of the first big collectors of English crowns. I remember him showing me this collection he had. And can I just tell you an odd story? The, the sort of guy he was. Robbie, how are you doing? I had a dream last night. I think you should do your work this way. Okay. And then he'd say, listen, I bought this hoard of coins. And uh, he'd gone to one of the coin dealers in Manchester and there was a hoard, a split hoard. So he was able to take it home. It was Edward I, Edward II, silver pennies. He sorted the whole lot out at night, worked out all the different mint vintages, vintages, and uh, he split the hoard into two. He sold the first one back at higher price than what he'd bought the lot. And then he had this massive, beautiful collection of silver pennies. A very clever guy. And uh, he invited me to uh, do research. I did a, a master's uh, under him on, on an uh, alkaloid called physovenine. Now, physovenine was a minor alkaloid in, in a plant called the calabar bean, physostigma venenosum, which basically means swollen bladder full of poison. <laughs> and uh, the calabar bean was used as an ordeal poison in West Africa. I don't know whether you've come across this idea of an old eagle poison, but if somebody in the tribe of that particular tribe had done wrong, let's say they'd been playing around with a few women or uh, assaulted somebody, quite often they would put these people on trial. And if it was a serious crime, they would get them to drink an extract of the calabar bean. I must say, it was a very potent poison, uh, and the British authorities eventually banned it. Anyway, at the time, they would get this person to drink some of this extract and literally, if they were guilty, they would die. If they were innocent, they would survive. Unknowing to the rest of the tribe, the uh, witch, witch doctors used to actually cook the extract up to, uh, to neutralize it, as it were. And uh, the act of alkaloid would be destroyed and the person would, be, uh, would survive. Uh, just an amazing sort of thing. And I used to work with extracts. I had enough extract probably to kick, kill the whole of Manchester at one point. Uh, luckily, I wasn't that sort of person. But uh, I remember doing this work on the masters and the pay later the PhD. I did my PhD. I'll mention that in a second. I used to get home and I used to stink, uh, stink of chemicals and all that sort of thing. Anyway, and of course, now we all have this big fright about carcinogenic solvents. And I used to handle benzene and chloroform, dichloromethane, ether, petroleum ether, all that sort of thing. I used to use buckets of this stuff. And uh, I got my MSc in Pfizer-Venine synthesis. And then uh, Brian said, well, what about a PhD? Do you fancy doing a doctorate? And uh, so I did a doctorate on um, the uh, determination, the three-dimensional shape of, of an alkaloid called physostigmine. There it is. I thought we'd just throw that in. Physostigmine. And you see those little dotted lines on it? Well, th they, they can be theoretically up or down. And my job uh, using chemical methods was to try and uh, determine what the exact shape of that thing was. You might say, well, why, why do you really need to know that? It's because that particular drug was a very potent cholinesterase. It stopped 
uh, anticholinesterase that stopped the enzyme from breaking down acetylcholine, which is a very potent uh, neurohormone in the body. And in actual fact, if you stop the enzyme breaking down acetylcholine, that allows the acetylcholine to survive longer. And uh, they used to apply phasostigma for myosin gravis, one of the uh, conditions, uh, nervous conditions, but also derivatives are, are still used for the treatment of dementia now. So if you can have the acetylcholine surviving longer, the, the dementia patient can at least deal with some of the symptoms that they had. So that was what I played around with, physostigmine there. And I was successful. I was very pleased at being able to do that. Uh, I can tell you about the week when we actually got the final results of a fairly complex set of investigations. Uh, Brian came storming in. Robbie, you wouldn't believe it. The Americans have done the same work. But luckily, they'd used a completely different method. And uh, we were able to get the same result, which is always very thankful. And uh, we were, both teams were credited with the discovery of the absolute configuration, the three-dimensional shape. So uh, I got my doctorate. And uh, I should actually just put a picture up. Um, no, I can't do it yet. Just hold on. Yes, carry on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one of the other things I did was uh, conserve a lot of Roman wood and leather. And um, what basically happened is I was great friends with a, a young prof, Barry Jones. And because uh, we, at that point, we were both uh, tutors in a hall of residence, the same hall of residence, Needham Hall. And uh, he came in one day, he said, Bobby, um, what's the chance that you could do some preservation of leather for me and f wood? He said, we've discovered this massive hoard of stuff up in this uh, civil settlement called Vindolanda. Vindolanda means white lawns, and it was a civil settlement for part of the Roman wall, the Hadrian's Wall. And uh, basically what had happened is that the natives at the time, the Romans and the natives at the time, were actually burying all their old leather and wood under uh, clay layers and served with bracken, and the bracken acted as a bit of a preservative. And they were dragging out this fantastic stuff. And I just thought I'd put up one of the pictures, one of the sandals we did. This is called the Thales Slipper. And you can actually Google it, and you'll, you'll see it on Google. And that slipper uh, is now preserved there in lanolin, and it looks absolutely fantastic, doesn't it? And you can actually see, when you actually examine it, a trademark on the sole. There's a sort of, I think it's an oak leaf or a vine leaf on that particular one, uh, which represented a shoemaker down in York. Uh, just an amazing piece of thing. And I've heard that uh, shoe manufacturers have tried to reproduce that particular shape as a nice fashion item. The other part about Vindolanda, I'll put this one up was the fact that they were discovering ro uh, wooden tablets. And these wooden tablets actually had Roman writing, Latin writing. Look at, the, look at that. And that's the sort of thing that they were discovering. I was up at the site one day when uh, they came in with some, and they just had these sort of wooden tablets. They opened it up, and when you looked at it, there was the Roman writing, the Latin writing. Et fortunatus est, da 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 dum. And they often tended to be orders from uh, local soldiers, uh, local commanders, and that, you know, please send the following supplies, etc., etc. Just an amazing set of uh, discoveries. So uh, I was doing quite a bit of that at one point. Can I just mention, yes, uh, one day Barry came in and he said, Bobby, he says, listen, we've got a, a bit of a dilemma up at the site at Vindolanda. Um, what apparently had happened was a professor from London had strayed onto the site and been chucked off, uh, been told to go. And he took his revenge by asking for a, a, an inquiry to be made of the excavation methods of Vindolanda. A bit naughty, but anyway, uh, Barry said, listen, a, a team of us are going up from Manchester because we had John Peter Wilde was doing uh, cloth. We had another guy doing pottery and we had me doing leather and wood. And he said, come on, we'll go up to the inquiry if you would like to appear. And I went into the inquiry. Remember, I'm a pharmacist. I'm not an archaeologist. And I went into this inquiry, into a room packed with professors and doctors and all this sort of thing. 
and I started passing some of the items round which I'd conserved. Shoes, leather straps, uh, a sort of plumber's bag, a leather jerkin, and I'll tell you what, we knocked their socks off. Some of these profs had never seen stuff like that. It was so good. And I passed some wood objects around and everything. It was one of the highlights of my sort of non-pharmacy life. Absolutely superb. While I was a tutor, I met this girl, Maggie. I used to play hockey on a Sunday afternoon, mixed hockey. Mixed hockey at uh, Manchester was quite a vicious game. Most of the guys limped off at some time. Uh, the girls were tech girls, for example, uh, tech team girls, and they would play mixed hockey on a Sunday afternoon. They were quite vicious and they would hurt us. And uh, w one day this young girl came across uh, serving coffee, I think it was, or orange juice or something. Her name was Maggie. And uh, Maggie and I uh, eventually got married but we had it as a, as a staff and student. I wasn't teaching her, so it was completely different. She was a uh, hotel and catering management student. And um, we had a fantastic time. Uh, apart from work, you've got to appreciate, Manchester was a, a superb place for parties, for balls. We had the winter ball, we had the summer ball, we had the spring ball, we had the vice chancellor's ball. And uh, you, you dressed up and Maggie would turn up in a new dress she'd made. Uh, what a life. We had a fantastic life. She also used to accompany me when I went fossiling. My second love, apart from pharmacy, and I suppose her, was uh, fossiling. I used to love hunting fossils. And uh, I always reckoned that if I didn't do pharmacy, I'd have done paleontology. I loved hunting fossils. fossils. And I still have my fossil collection here. We brought it from England to uh, WA. And I still follow a lot of the news going on about the uh, finding of different animals and all that sort of thing, different remains. And uh, I suppose the upshot eventually was Maggie and I were married in 1968. 1968. So that's 52 years this year. Through thick and thin, we have, we have a few battles on occasions, but uh, we understand each other. We call ourselves Team Longmore. And uh, we're both ruled by a, a little dog as well, so we have a great time. But uh, we emigrated to Western Australia in uh, December 1975, bringing our two kids, which we had by now. Uh, Andy was four and Vicky was two. I remember us going to the uh, embassy in, uh, wasn't there an embassy office in Manchester, just to check things out and what we had to do and everything like that. And uh, I know our Andy was a little bit naughty on the occasion. And, uh, but we got through, we were accepted, everything was great. And we flew out in December 75 to WA. We, f we left a country where it was snow. The only gateway they had to get flights off was on the Wednesday. And it was bitterly cold and the planes were sort of taking off one after the other after the other. And we landed in Australia, 42 degrees in Western Australia. And the flies thought, oh, great, fantastic, fresh palms. And we were covered in flies because you had to walk from the aircraft to the, uh, to the uh, centre there, to uh, the airport. And, uh, but it was great. And it was a very good move, let me tell you. One of the best moves I've made. So we joined uh, WAIT, which was the West Australian Institute of Technology as it was then. Uh, I actually got there without interview, just, I don't know how. I think the prof at uh, Manchester wanted to get rid of me. I was a bit of, must have been out of, uh, in his hair a bit. Anyway, Peter decided that uh, I should go. He was an external examiner for weight and he got me a, a job straight there. So I came as a lecturer to um, weight. And a fantastic move. Wait later became the Curtin University uh, of Technology. It was the first technology uh, university in Australia under the uh, uh, chancellorship of, uh, vice chancellorship, sorry, of uh, Don Watts, a chemist, a very brilliant chemist from uh, UWA. And um, yes, just an amazing place. Uh, I came to teach pharmacy 
but uh, I was given the news a little bit later in uh, early 76. Well, Bob, uh, we want you, yes, to teach farm, farm chem, medicinal chemistry. Uh, it'd be good if you do some pharmacognosy, which is crude drugs. And uh, you're going to do some radio pharmacy, radio pharmacy, radioactivity. I, I was scared, absolutely scared, radioactivity. And um, remembering that in Manchester, we'd had a demonstration uh, when I did my undergraduate degree of what uh, radioactivity was about. We used coloured solutions. Blue solution was supposed to represent uh, radioactivity. This time I was going to go to Lucas Heights in New South Wales to do a uh, short course in nuclear medicine. And uh, I did. I went over in, I think it was November 76, and uh, probably became the first radio pharmacist in WA, uh, and teaching undergraduates and postgraduates for many years, right up to after I retired in 2000, up to 2004. Fantastic. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. It was scary when we did the course at uh, Lucas Heights, uh, learning all about radiation, but it was good fun. And uh, you actually learn to respect radiation. I still do. Um, I will say I support the idea of, nu uh, of doing um, nuclear development of energy and all that sort of thing, but uh, it's not a view which is held popularly in WA. But we've got the uranium, we should use nuclear energy, but Never mind, that's another story. And I used to teach uh, diagnostic radio pharmacy for many years, uh, something I, I really enjoyed. One of the things about weight and then curtain was the range of subjects you had to deal with. Pharmaceutical and medicinal chemistry, that's okay. It's, it's basically discovery of drugs, synthesis of drugs, analysis of drugs, all that sort of thing. And then pharmacognosy, which was uh, crude drugs, vegetable drugs, animal drugs, that sort of thing. And um, out of pharmacognosy came my interest in herbal remedies, which I followed for many, many years. And I also taught food science for another department. And uh, we used to have some absolute laughs there. Uh, we used to do food analysis. One of the things we did uh, was a project for example, comparing two foods for protein, fat, carbohydrate, all that sort of thing. And I re vividly remember one of the projects I got the girls to do, a couple of girls to do, was to compare snails, snail meat, with chicken. And you think, oh, well, that's a bit unusual. Anyway, basically, we're going to have a look. And honestly, the uh, protein content of snails is excellent. And uh, the girls ended up there, a study by uh, cooking some snails, garden snails, large ones, and they served them on a snail dish in garlic butter. And we had them all ready for people just to try. And this uh, lady, Esme, came in and she said, what are you doing, Bob? I said, oh, we're just comparing snails and chicken. And she said, oh, can I try a snail? A little bit gritty they were. The girls hadn't cleaned them as good as they might be, but anyway. I had to stop the lady from eating all the snails. They were that good. And we all had some snails. So these are the sort of things we used to get up to. Uh, and as I said, uh, herbal remedies, all that sort of situation. Uh, I supervised a couple of PhD students, uh, Philip Kerr, who is now over in Eastern States, and uh, Yandy. Yandy Liu was uh, a mainland Chinese, came over and uh, I say this with all due respect to Yandi, but uh, his English was very difficult to follow at times. His writing was worse, but he was a very good worker, one of the best workers I've come across. And uh, that particular work, we worked on um, sandalwood seeds and um, basically finding out what, about the acetylenic fatty acids and uh, whether they were toxic, could you eat sandalwood seeds? And he had to do some uh, experiments with mice. Again, done with care. Uh, I won't tell you how we did the injection, but uh, he was regarded as an expert on how to do that and uh, produced some very, very good work. And he was the one who um, really urged me to do much better in my uh, writing of papers. I should say that when I was at uh, Manchester, Brian used to do all the papers. He used to write the research papers. He'd come in the morning, right, Robbie, I've written this, I've written that. 
And I never really got the good training for Brian to write papers. I never had the confidence to do it at times. But uh, at Waite and then Curtin, uh, you may remember there's a technology park. And one day uh, the uh, head of school came up and said, Bob, we're, we're going to move you over to the technology park where we do some operations, some changes of structure in the school. And um, it wasn't sort of quarantine, but it was separation. It took you away and I was able to start writing, especially with uh, Yandy. And we wrote uh, some good papers on sandalwood. And that was really the uh, picking up of my abilities to do that sort of thing. The other student was uh, Philip Kerr, and we worked on maroon bush, Scavola spinescens. And uh, maroon bush is an Aboriginal plant which is used as a tonic and an anti-cancer uh, herb. And in actual fact, there's the reason why we had the Chem Centre in Perth. Uh, the Chem Centre was set up to investigate and to uh, use maroon bush extracts to treat cancer. The Premier John Tonkin um, had had a massive interest in uh, scavola and maroon bush and um, wanted it to be pursued and therefore he got the chem centre set up. Uh, sadly, a lot of the patients who got the extracts were really fairly far gone in their uh, particular condition and uh, it's not really the best treatment, you know, to, to take a herbal medicine and to treat somebody who's already very, very advanced in their, uh, their cancer. Nevertheless, I've heard of some very, very good uh, cures and the like. And uh, Philip was able to isolate uh, a few compounds of strong interest, and w which had anti-cancer activity. And he was able to complete his PhD on that work. Uh, I will say that Yandy completed his PhD and uh, is still there at uh, Curtin University uh, doing research work. Uh, very, very good. During that sort of time, one of the pharmacists in WA, a friend of mine, approached me and said, listen, an Australian pharmacist, which is a, a premier journal in Australia, said uh, they wanted somebody to talk about, write about herbal remedies. So I was uh, commissioned to start writing articles every month. And uh, to be honest, I was very pleased with them. I wrote about 160 articles for them. Uh, I got paid, which was a commission. And um, I think I only had one letter uh, of concern about the articles I wrote and sad to say I shot him down in flames as well because he was wrong. Uh, I should tell everybody that uh, I'm always right even when I'm wrong. But uh, no, I wrote some very good, very good articles. Uh, one of the popular herbs at the present time, isn't it? Turmeric, that yellow uh, rhizome. And I wrote one on there. What basically used to happen is I had a month to write an article. And I'd spend two or three weeks thinking of the title and the subject. And then in the last couple of days, I'm a procrastinator by heart. Uh, in the last couple of days, I write the article. And one of the best ones I wrote was on turmeric called The Yellow Subterrene. Oh, fantastic title. Uh, anyway, I wrote all those. And I kept on for quite a long time. Um, I actually retired in July 2000 for a variety of reasons, a little bit earlier. So I, I was able to sort of pack my bags and go. And um, I had some <coughs> good superannuation, which was very good. And uh, we uh, had already bought a block in Nanop. We bought that in 1991. And that means effectively nearly, nearly 30 years we've been connected with Nanop. Uh, which is one of the uh, superb communities in the southwest. I should w I should mention that before I um, left Perth, before I really retired, Maggie and I were very very strong in sport uh, with our children. They did little little athletics. They did uh, Andy did soccer. Uh, I did coaching of soccer, junior soccer, and. Um, I was a secretary for Canning Corinthians with uh, a team of good guys. And um, I was invited to be a state manager. I was state manager of junior soccer for seven years, taking teams over to the Eastern States. Had a fantastic time. And um, we also used to follow cricket at the Wacker, 15 years of that, 15, 16 years of that. 
and uh, you know a very very good life but holidays and regular weekends were held down in Nanop and we used to go down there when we bought the block we put a shed up we put a garage up and we used to go and sleep in that garage when we went down we had a bed in there we had a toilet in there and uh, we had some absolutely superb times you know cooking under the stars and that sort of situation and um, I remember one time we went down we opened the door went in just pulled the covers of the bed back and there's a little mouse going what are you doing here you know peculiar <laughs> but we had a fantastic time again and um, we used to take our car down packed with trees I'd grown in Nanup, you know seedlings and cuttings and the like and we plant a whole load we take some like a hundred pots we'd plant them up next time we go down see how many had died but um, the result was we eventually converted that block from, which was a sheep paddock initially into a, an area with lots of trees around the boundary to act as a windbreak and lots of trees generally and uh, it developed into a very very good block so um, 1998 we decided to build a house we'd had a, a good bit of fortune with the way things had gone at um, Curtin and uh, as I said we had a nice bit of super ran there put aside we were able to make decisions on um, different things and we were able to build a house so we built this beautiful double story cedar I wouldn't say it fulfilled Maggie's wishes initially because she'd wanted to live by the coast in a single story house with a tin roof and brick building but so we ended up with a wood house double story in Nanup which is lovely uh, on an 80 acre block and the uh, Nanup itself as a choice was fantastic uh, Nanup is a superb community I'll say that now uh, it's only got about 630 people in the town itself about 1300 in the whole shire it's the second biggest shire but it's a superb place to live and uh, it's been very very good i love it for its location i often call it the oasis in the forest and again hey what's happened we've gone back to the wilding sort of concept you know uh, we were able to develop the block that we wanted um, i will say in the meantime i also uh, it, uh, nominated as a councillor and uh, I was able to serve as a councillor for eight years which gives you an interesting sort of insight into local government and the like I served as a councillor for eight years and also served on many committees uh, in the um, in, in that sort of thing now I'm just being a bit remiss I should put this one up I mentioned about getting a PhD there's Bob in his Bird of Paradise uh, gown. Fantastic. Look at the colours. Scarlet stuff it was described as with a gold trim and a Tudor hat. That's the only photograph I've got of me as a doctoral uh, uh, person. Uh, I couldn't afford to get official photographs done. I was that broke. Anyway, look at it. Beautiful. And we used to, Brian and I used to go along all these faculty meetings and everything like that into degree nominations I should now yes this is uh, weight or curtain when I was uh, doing a lot of chemistry one of my uh, uh, students there Nicole and I just demonstrate how to do solvent extraction I used to love doing practical chemistry I find it very difficult to understand when uh, students were saying oh I don't like chemistry I don't understand it it was a fantastic science to follow had brilliant times right so uh, and a lot of my career what have i done i've got very very strong interest in gardening and i thought this was quite a nice one uh one of my favorite people is prince charles <laughs> don't laugh prince charles and he talks to plants and i'm i thought this one was quite apt what am i supposed to say when they ask me things you know ignore them so we often talk to plants we maggie and i have got a great love of plants and um We've tried to do a lot uh, of different representations. I mean, this is at the Bailing Up Small Farm Field Day. Maggie and I doing insect hotels and the like. Look at it. We look like two country people. And uh, just lately this year, uh, I, I've done a couple of YouTubes for the uh, Nanup Youth 
community thing on insect hotels. And uh, here's Bob demonstrating insect hotels. And that's been very effective. We've done it around the area and uh, they work and uh, people find it very interesting. One of the things we put up in the garden, we, we, we do a few overseas holidays incidentally and one year we decided not to go on overseas holidays so Bob could have a greenhouse. So we bought this big greenhouse, put it up, it was like a big Meccano set putting it up. And there's a picture of me uh, eventually producing one cucumber. Just amazing. But it's a very nice one, filled with tropical plants and the like, bananas, coffee, orchids, all that sort of thing. Do you miss anything from leaving from the UK? Yes, apart from my parents, obviously. Uh, I miss competitive fishing, match fishing, what we call it, match fishing. It's recreational fishing, you, you catch and release all the time. But this last year, just before I left, this is the sort of cup haul I had. I was doing very, very good. I loved it. Breeding maggots, fishing. I used to do three matches a week in the height of summer, Tuesday nights, Saturday afternoons and Sunday mornings. Ah, oh, lovely. 2004, a close friend of mine in Nanup invited me to um, go to the Arctic with them. We went to the Canadian Arctic and uh, we had an absolutely fantastic week there fishing. And uh, this is uh, on the last day I caught this Iceland char and um, it was catch and release. We had to treat them very, very carefully. Please be assured. And uh, it was released without harm and lived to fight another day. But absolutely superb holiday again. So uh, I suppose when you talk about the adventures of Dr. Bob, this is one of the adventures, something I'll never repeat. And um, one week we're standing there in the Arctic next to places where it is, they said, if you fall in, Bob, we're not going to be able to get you. It's that deep and that fast and that cold. And then the next week, we're in uh, the uh, island at Vancouver, Vancouver Island, uh, fishing in the river there and uh, fishing just with shorts and a shirt on, fishing for uh, pink salmon. Oh, just amazing. Again, fishing. <sighs> Who's this guy? This is me uh, in my gradual dotage and uh, I hope you've enjoyed what uh, I've been talking about. I should also mention, I just mentioned, look at these cheat sheet notes I've got here. I love cooking shows, especially Rick Stein. I, if there's anybody a groupie for Rick, it's me. I've got quite a few of his books. I've got his DVD and we also love the English versions of MasterChef and MasterChef The Professionals. I don't like the Australian ones, I'm sorry, but the English ones are much, much better. Uh, I'm a peasant style cook and uh, Maggie and I love our cooking. We also take a lot of inspiration from uh, foreign holidays. Uh, we've been very fortunate in being able to go to France, well, the UK obviously, but France, North America, Italy, and last year, Japan, which was absolutely amazing. Uh, and that's virtually it. Uh, retirement is basically gardening. I do a lot of gardening talks. Uh, we have developed a superb set of wicking beds, vegetable garden, food forest, greenhouse. We open our garden occasionally. And then uh, the latest project has been this large natural recreational swimming pond, complete with goldfish. When it gets warmer, I'm going in. I've been in once and I survived. And then uh, I should also finish by just mentioning that we've still got these two great kids, Andy and Vicky, who live locally. Andy and Margaret River, Vicky and Bustleton. And they've given us five absolutely superb grandchildren who are all sporting ilks. Violet, Donnie, Imogen, uh, Ari and Siobhan. And uh, we have an awful lot of pride in those two. I'm looking at the bottom there, but I think that's about it. I've got nothing on here. <sighs> we got some questions. It's dead. <laughs> 
Hi folks, <laughs> my charming assistant Keely. Thank you, by the way, thank you for watching. I was a little bit unsure as to whether people would en enjoy this. I thought adventures, yeah, well, life's been an adventure. What is it about where you live in Nanup that invigorates you? Look, what is it about living in Nanup that invigorates you? Look, Nanup is a fantastic community. Okay, I served as a councillor for a while, so I saw the other side of the fence, but look, we have the typical bell-shaped curve of uh, community members. Some are difficult to deal with, but the vast majority are beautiful, friendly people. We have a massive range of interests. Uh, I remember years ago, they actually did a, a sort of um, survey of how many recreational groups there were in Nanup. And honestly, I don't tell a lie, there were about 70 different interest and recreational groups in Nanup. We used to do quizzes there, and apparently in Nanup we had the highest level of tertiary educated community members. If you look at people in Nanup, they cover massive ranges of interest. And just lately we've had the North Nanup community, which is our little cellular area centered around a fire shed. And we actually have a, a superb social life. So look, life is a breeze. It's great fun in Nanup. And uh, I'd recommend you come any time. And I'll also recommend, we've got the Flower and Garden Festival coming up. Well, it's started. Uh, I, I'm presenting on Saturday uh, for the first time this year. Uh, but well worth coming to Nanup, just have a look at the tulips, have a look at the little town, get used to the idea of what a nice community it is. So that is, ah, oh. second question. <laughs> this is Bob's ego trip here. What is your formula for staying healthy and vibrant? Well, I've got very strong views on, uh, we have a, a very good diet, Maggie and I. We, uh, our aim was to get about 80% plus of self-sufficiency and we uh, don't buy much in the way of vegetables. We do buy vegetables occasionally, but we actually grow an awful lot of our vegetables, uh, especially the greens and the, uh, you know, the peas and the beans. Uh, we have chooks, we have ducks, and uh, that contributes an awful lot. Medically, I've suffered a couple of conditions. I virtually entered the Operation A Year Club for a couple of years ago, uh, but that's all good now. I've not had anything really serious. And uh, my medication is minimal, hypertension, and that's about it. So uh, that's my formula for living. We enjoy our food, we enjoy our exercise, and we enjoy the things we do. Give us an example of how chemistry can be applied to everyday life. Oh, that's a deadly question. Well, first of all, okay, I love doing Facebook. And Facebook has got some beautiful people in, but also people who make statements all the time and don't really, I don't think they understand what they're saying. Chemistry is very, very important. When they talk about food having chemicals in, well, yeah, food is chemical by nature, but it's also got things like preservatives and colorings. I don't like colorings. I worry about preservatives, and I worry about the artificiality of some food. But chemistry allows us to understand who we are, where we are, what we're doing. Uh, and I think it's so important. And I think, um, obviously, food is very, very important to me. And uh, I think if you understand what you're eating, what you're doing, it's good. Does that really answer it? I hope so. Uh, chemistry is the foundation of life, as is biology and physics. Hey, I'll tell you what, I'm interested in space travel. Mars. I, I have this love of Mars. I have DVDs, I have Follow the Mars Society, Robert Zubrin. I have quite a few of his books. And uh, I think that's part, somebody asked about vibrancy of life. Look, interests, without being boring, I had a friend at uh, Curtin who retired and uh, we give him a party and everything like that. And he came back about six months later and said, what are you doing back? He said, Bob, I'm bored, I'm bored. And in actual fact, uh, he said, 
look at the three things you need in life. You need a good house paid off. You need a good car and you need a hobby. He said, I've got no hobbies. I've got no interests at all. I asked him if he wanted to have one of mine. I've got so many interests. I've got too many interests. It's embarrassing. I'd love to do more model railways. I do my gardening. I do fossils. I do fishing. I read books. Oh. Any more questions? Thank you so much for watching. Please uh, enjoy life. Uh, you can get in touch with me anytime. I'm in Nanup. And uh, I hope you come and see our Flower and Garden Festival. Uh, my wife Maggie is the chair. She's doing a fantastic job with that. The town is alive with the tulips and everything. It's looking great. Thank you.